Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Nancy Jang. I'm the uh, current laryngology clinical instructor. And I chose this sort of controversial topic for Grand Rounds because it's something that sort of really resonates with me personally and has been sort of bothering me ever since uh, residency. Um, and so I thought I wanted to explore this and see uh, where this would take me. Um, so give you a little bit of background of why I chose this topic. Um, when I was a resident and we had resident clinic where we saw patients on our own, patients with all these complaints of hoarseness, cough, choking, globus, dysphagia, we gave them all one diagnosis and that was laryngopharyngeal reflux. And this was taught to me by my chief residents, it was taught to me by my attendings. And you know, we give them twice a day PPI therapy, we send them home, say come back in three months. And pretty much every patient I saw that came back in three months didn't get better for the most part or they never came back. And so when they didn't get better, we said, you know what, we have to double the dose, and then we have to give you an H2 blocker, and then you'll get better. And then three months, you say, you know, come back in three months. And then hopefully by then, I'm off the rotation, I don't see them anymore, because <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't know what to do with them. And that's basically the cycle, and that's how these patients were seen in our clinic. And I started to wonder if that was just my anecdotal experience, or if it's like a global national phenomenon. And being at Stanford here, and being in our laryngology practice here, um, you know, just anecdotally here, I've seen so many patients referred to the office here with an initial diagnosis of LPR who don't have LPR as an explanation for their symptoms, especially hoarseness. I mean, we've seen so many patients come in with spasmodic dysphonia or leukoplakia or thrush or other things that were told time and time again they had LPR. And so I, I, was, I asked the question to myself, you know, how did we get to this point? And why is it that it's so, LPR is so prevalent and it's become sort of what we call the hammer of laryngology, you know, I'm sure. Because Ed and Kwong don't rotate off service, and they have to do something. Yeah, <laughs> when they come back in six months, it's like, oh, what are we doing? <laughs> um, so I'm sure you guys have heard the quote. <laughs> um, if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. And I think that LPR has become the hammer for all symptoms related to laryngology. Um, and um, looking at the literature, it seems that my hunch was right in terms of a, sort of a national phenomenon of this. This is um, a study done in the early 2000s looking at um, ENTs treating patients for reflux. Um, in the early 90s, about 89,000 patients uh, nationally would be seen for reflux-related problems by an ENT. By the early 2000s, that number went to 421,000. And reflux encounters were less than 1% of our practices in the 90s. And in the early 2000s, it became 3% of our practice. So this is a 300% increase in LPR. So it's either, um, you know, we, it's much greater awareness of this disease or an overdiagnosis. And you know, something's going on here. Or there's something in the air where everybody all of a sudden has developed LPR, but I don't think that's the reason. And this is also not just reflected in ENT, but also in the primary care sector um, in, with internal medicine. Here's a survey done. Um, on uh, primary care physicians and their practice patterns. Um, they were asked, when a patient comes into your office with unclear etiology of hoarseness, what is the first thing you do for these patients? And over 80% of them will prescribe reflux medication as their go-to treatment for dysphonia. Not an exam by an ENT, you know, not a look at their vocal cords, reflux medication. And some of them also give antihistamines, but that's by and large the, the biggest thing they give. And they think, you know, they believe that reflux is the hoarseness sorry, is largely due to reflux. Um, and so this idea has perpetuated through other fields as well. And I think that more and more we're starting to realize as a group that maybe there is this overdiagnosis of LPR. Um, a survey of general ENTs at our academy meeting um, stated that, you know, 46.5% of them stated that they were concerned about an overdiagnosis of LPR. Which is surprising, the number is actually not too high. I would think that more of us would think there's an overdiagnosis issue. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there is reason to be concerned. Um, there are some studies now showing that this is a problem. Um, this is a paper from uh, Lucian Salika. He's out of Cornell. He looked at his own practice at 26 patients that came to him for a second opinion after they were diagnosed with LPR. And they had persistent hoarseness, all of them, for at least uh, eight months. And they were told they had LPR. And when he evaluated them with a, stro a strobe exam, he found that none of them had LPR. Um, they had all sorts of diagnoses for their hoarseness, phonotraumatic lesions, neurologic disorders, presbyolaryngitis, thrush, and he treated them respectively for each of these individual diseases and got, you know, resolution of the hoarseness. 
Um, a similar study came out of OHSU looking at the same, you know, same idea. 102 patients um, with hoarseness with a diagnosis of LPR prior to their evaluation. 86.6% of those, by the way, was diagnosed by an ENT. So somebody had scoped them and told them they have LPR. Again, none of these 102 patients were diagnosed with LPR after evaluation. Uh, this is a list of all things that he ended up diagnosing the patients with. Um, and uh, scarily enough, actually one patient in the 102 had squamous cell carcinoma that was diagnosed as LPR. So this has really become a, a, a problem, I think, um, because we're missing diagnosis, we're, we're misdiagnosing patients, and we're not giving them the care they're supposed to get. Um, and there's also an economic burden associated with this. Um, this is a study from at Vanderbilt where they prospectively followed patients that came into Vanderbilt um, <coughs> for eva uh, evaluation of a um, host of symptoms that suggested LPR. So they treated these patients over time and followed them prospectively and calculated both their direct and indirect costs. And the mean total cost per patient with LPR in the initial year cost about $5,000, which is 5.6 times the annual cost to treat reflux. And 86% of this was contributed to medication, the majority of which is PPIs. <coughs> We've been taught that you need to give these patients high dose, you know, twice a day therapy, which is expensive. Um, and interestingly, after all these costs, only about 54% of these patients had improvement or resolution of their symptoms. So we're spending all this money and all this energy treating them, and yet we're not getting a great response rate. Um, and this graph is kind of striking. This is just in an estimate, so I don't know how accurate this is, but they estimate on a national scale how much um, does, is LPR costing us economically. And it costs about $50 billion a year, and it's close to the money we spend on cancer treatment and diagnosis, whereas reflux is all the way over here, about $9 billion. So what is it about LPR that's so different from GERD that costs so much more money and yet doesn't have such great outcomes as, as GERD does? Um, and so I think the rest of my talk is going to focus on how we got to this, this state. You know, It's either we're over-diagnosing them or our treatment options are incorrect. Um, so first I'm going to go over sort of LPR in the literature, kind of how we got to this point, the problems with the diagnosis of LPR itself, problems with the treatment of LPR, and new ideas of LPR suggesting that maybe it's not the acid, maybe it's the pepsin, and um, so finish with some conclusions. So the idea of LPR sort of started in the, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. This is one of the first papers talking about this <coughs> phenomenon, um, and they called it acid laryngitis at the time. This was a smart, small chart review of nine patients who all had hoarseness, globus, um, and or heartburn. And they all were found to have this sort of nondescript posterior laryngeal edema, or this heaped up mucosa in the postcricoid area. And they all had reflux seen on barium swallow. And when they were treated for the reflux with, um, with medication and had a bed elevation, all of the cases improved symptomatically and clinically. And so thus was born this idea that maybe acid reflux is coming all the way up and actually irritating our throat and causing these complaints and these symptoms. And there's several of these sort of small case series um, put out through the, the um, 70s and 80s. And really the, the, the paper that led the groundwork to LPR as we know it today it was a paper by Dr. Um, Kaufman in 1991. Um, if you guys haven't read this, uh, this is a 78-page paper, <laughs> which took me a long time to get through. Um, and maybe why a lot of people haven't read it. <laughs> but it's uh, 50 pages of it are actually about background information. So there's two parts of the study. I'm only going to focus on the, the part that, that was um, on patients. The other part was an animal study, so I'm not going to go into. But the general hypothesis of this paper is that reflux is the explanation to a host of laryngeal abnormalities. And to support this hypothesis, um, there were 182 patients enrolled um, in the study prospectively with suspected reflux-related laryngeal problems. And these patients didn't just have LPR with nothing else. Um, these patients had laryngeal cancer, subglottic stenosis, um, you know, vocal fold granulomas, vocal fold nodules, all things that Dr. Coffin thought were related to reflux. And then there were 32 normal patients with no disease, um, and they were used as normative data. And so all patients underwent double probe pH monometry, bef uh, sorry, pH um, monitoring before and after treatment. Um, and uh, the, the definition of abnormal uh, LPR was more 
uh, one or more reflux or acidic reflux events in the pharynx. And uh, all patients were placed on anti-reflux medication, and then the therapy was escalated for non-responders, and they were treated for a minimum of six months. So here, here are the results, interestingly. So only 43% of them had classic GERD symptoms of heartburn and regurgitation, so it's, it's pretty low. The most common complaints of these patients were hoarseness, chronic cough, globus, chronic throat clearing, and dysphagia, which are all things we now contribute to LPR. I just want to remind you again, this was a heterogeneous group of patients. They, not, they had other things, like cancer, sepsis, other things. But they all, you know, these were, the, this were sort of the common symptoms among them all. 60% of them had laryngeal edema, and 60% had laryngeal erythema. And interestingly, only 62% of them had abnormal pH testing. So only 62% of them had objective data showing that they had acid reflux. And despite that, uh, symptoms improved in 85% of these patients after six months of anti-reflux medication. So to sort of put all this together, this was sort of Dr. Kaufman's um, um, conclusions. One is that the majority of patients have silent reflux because, like I said, less than half of them had heartburn and regurgitation. So LPR patients have silent reflux. Reflux tends to be intermittent. And why is that? Because the pH testing didn't pick up 40% of the patients. <coughs> with these symptoms. So it's not that maybe it's not acid reflux <coughs> causing symptoms, it's the, the, the hypothesis here is that we're not catching these episodes, that they don't happen on a daily basis, which is why we don't catch it on objective testing. And so, you know, patients with normal pH testing can still have LPR. And, you know, to kind of support this um, conclusion, um, Dr. Kaufman cites that 15 of the patients actually had radiographic evidence of reflux and negative to pH testing, and seven patients had uh, vocal process granulomas, which um, she, uh, Dr. Kahn believes is re completely related to reflux, and so and they had negative pH testing. <clears throat> and so uh, the conclusion was pH testing is 100% specific but not sensitive, and that kind of led to everything we know about reflux today. Um, between 1991 and early 2000, there are a few small studies here and there, but th that was really the groundwork um, for our academy's position statement on LPR in about, this is I think 2002. So um, the academy put out a paper kind of outlining how, what LPR is and how we should treat it. it. Stated that LPR, again, is different from GERD. The majority of patients don't have esophagitis or heartburn. Right? Up to half of patients with laryngeal and voice disorders have reflux. Diagnosis can be made on the basis of symptoms and laryngeal findings alone. Because although the gold, sta gold standard is ambulatory 24-hour double probe pH monitoring, it's not sensitive enough. And it's really you have to rely on the symptoms and f physical findings. And treatment with PPI needs to be more aggressive and more prolonged than for GERD. The majority of patients will require twice daily dosing of PPI. And in, you may even need to add an H2 blocker to treat them adequately. And you need to do this for a minimum of six months before you notice an improvement. And so after this paper came out, there obviously a lot of interest was generated um, in, in the literature. And so I'll show you in a second, but there's quite an increase in publications of LPR, which is good, because it really helps to increase our understanding of this. Um, sorry, and one more thing. Interesting, they suggested that an alternative to treat these patients is actually to go straight to fundoplication. Um, so these are the symptoms that they uh, uh, this table that they, that they said are associated with reflux, expounding upon the ones earlier, and all the conditions that are related to LPR that was listed in this paper, based on um, a lot of these uncontrolled small series of uh, patients, anything from subglottic stenosis, carcinoma of the larynx, sinusitis, otitis media, sleep apnea, even exacerbation of asthma, all of this could potentially be contributed to LPR. So that's the case. We really need to figure out the pathophysiology and the correct treatment because if you can treat LPR, technically you could alleviate all of these problems potentially because this could be the root cause for all of these problems. At least that's what the you know position paper stated. And you know over the years we d we have had a, quite an increase in the number of publications on LPR, um, kind of an exponential increase. And um, this was published in 2008, so the data is cut off here. But it's it's more and more every year, which is good. But when they analyzed this data, interestingly, from this paper, and they looked at, well, what kind of papers are they? 
well, almost half of them were review papers. So what does that mean? People were just writing this over and over again, this idea, without coming up with new data. And these review papers were published not just in ENT, they're published in PEDS, GI, pulmonary, primary care you know, um, journals, um, far-reaching journals, so that this idea has been ex you know, spread throughout all of medicine. So everybody pretty much knows what LPR is these days because of this, which is great. But at the same time, we have very little published on the etiology and pathogenesis of this. So we really don't have a good understanding of what LPR is. A lot of it also has been focused on diagnosis, because that's still a question. And I think, you know, like I said before, we treat patients, they don't get better. So are we really capturing these patients? So a lot of effort and research has been focused on that as well. But what we really need is more work here. You know, the etiology, the pathogenesis, what is really going on in these patients? And to see how far-reaching this has become, I mean, there. You know, JAMA is one of the most read journals out there, right, the New England Journal of Medicine, and we have an ENT review article in here published, and it's on LPR, and it says the same things from Dr. Kaufman's paper, right? LPR is different than GERD. It takes at least six months for symptoms and related physical findings to resolve, and unlike GERD, you have to, you have to be more aggressive with the PPI therapy, and, and a more prolonged therapy may be needed, and so on and so forth. All these original ideas from her paper were just sort of put in this re review article. So I'm going to just sort of switch gears and talk about well, what are some of the problems with LPR and how, why is it getting overdiagnosed potentially. <clears throat> so first, the symptoms of LPR. So we're told that you can diagnose patients based on symptoms and exam findings alone. So let's look at the symptoms more carefully. So to sort of help us in making our diagnosis of LPR, um, this rating scale has been come up, which is, I think, a great idea. You know, it's called the Reflex Symptom Index. So you have a patient fill out a survey, and you score it. And if they score above a 13, you can be pretty sure they have LPR. And that's the goal of this, this rating scale. And I just want, I highlighted these three questions here that I, was kind of, I thought was kind of interesting. Hoarseness, dysphagia, and difficulty breathing. They're kind of like everything we see in laryngology, right? <laughs> it falls under these categories. And this apparently all falls under LPR. Um, so anyways, the way they've, they've validated this tool, and by the way, this tool is pretty much used in all papers now looking at LPR. Pretty much most papers will use this as one of the ways they diagnose LPR and use this as a validated tool to report their results. How they validated this was they took 25 patients with known LPR based on, their, based on um, results from 24-hour double probe pH testing, and then they were followed prospectively. The RSI was administered at baseline and then at six months. And then they had some normative data from people you know, who had no LPR. And they found that the mean LPR in, in the symptomatic group uh, was 20.9 and it improved to 12.8 with therapy. And in the control group, the mean RSI was 11.6. And so the conclusion based on this, and with calculating 95% you know, um, confidence intervals, was that RSI above 13 is abnormal. Okay. Now, to really validate this tool, you need to, to compare it to the gold standard with all comers, right? To really answer the question of, is this tool valid, you have to ask, if every patient comes in that you suspect is LPR, and you give them RSI, the survey, versus you give them the, the pH test, what is the correlation there? What is the sensitivity and specificity of RSI compared to the gold standard a double probe pH monitoring? At least at that time, that was the gold standard. Um, and a few studies after this have looked into this. And when you actually compare RSI to go the gold standard, the sensitivity is OK, but the specificity of RSI is pretty poor. Um, anywhere from 18.8% to 47.3% specificity. So this is not a very specific tool to use. So you can't say that because they have a score of over 13, you can be 95% confident they have R, uh, LPR. That's just not the case. Um, that's just not enough you know, to diagnose them. Um, and, well, the, and so then you know, the, my question was, what could they have? If the RSI is over 13, if it's not LPR, what do they have? Well, there's a lot of symptom overlap in their laryngology, right? I mean, these symptoms can maybe potentially reflect paresis, vocal fold atrophy, other things. And uh, here, just an example here of a study that looked at this, the symptom overlap between LPR and glottic insufficiency in vocal fold atrophy patients. So they looked at 26 patients, and they all scored above 13 on RSI, but they all also had a diagnosis of vocal fold atrophy. And when they treated them for the vocal fold atrophy, either with speech therapy or vocal fold augmentation, their RSI, RSI scores went down to normal. So these patients, according to the scale, 
if you just looked at the scale, you would say they have reflux, I need to treat them with a PPI, but really, they have vocal fold atrophy, they got the appropriate treatment, and their RSI symptoms went down. So another, other possible explanations other than LPR, right? Other problem is with the exam findings of LPR. So we're told the combination of the symptoms and then the, this exam findings of laryngeal ear thema and edema. So what does that mean? Uh, again, to try to help us, and again, a great idea uh, where, they, where they try to come up with a scale to help us diagnose LPR on exam findings. So these are specific things you're supposed to look for when you scope somebody for LPR. Subglottic <coughs> edema, ventricular obliteration, overall erythema, diffuse or in the retinoids only, vocal fold edema, diffuse laryngeal edema, posterior commissure hypertrophy, if there's granuloma or granulation tissue, and thick endolaryngeal mucus. And a score above seven is supposed to, again, make you pretty confident that the patient has LPR. So to validate this tool, they did a similar study as the RSI. They took 40 patients who had confirmed LPR and treated them, um, and sorry, scoped them before treatment, then at two months and four months and six months after treatment. And then they had some age match controls. And so, and then the RFS was scored by two single blinded laryngologists to try to look for interrater reliability. So the RSI for the normal, or sorry, RFS for the normal group was 5.2. RS, RFS for the LPR group was greater than 7, and, and the correlation coefficient um, was 0.9 between the two laryngologists. So this is something that supposedly other people can use um, and get a pretty reliable score. And they saw an improvement in the RFS over a course of six months. Again, what you really got to do is take all comers, right, and compare this to the gold standard, not just people with known diagnosis. And when you do that, um, again, the specificity for this tool is low. It's 37.5%. Um, and actually, the inter-rater reliability is much lower than the 0.9 uh, suggested in the original paper. You see, in this study, they took five blinded ENTs, and they had them look at laryngeal videos of pa patients. And there was very poor inter-rater reliability. The correlation coefficient ranged anywhere from 0.161 to 0.461 per item. So nobody was in agreement on these findings. And for severity, too, no agreement on the findings, 0.265 correlation coefficient. And for the diagnosis of LPR itself, correlation coefficient of 0.246. So this tool is clearly not really reliable from doctor to doctor. So that's a problem, right? I could see LPR and maybe you don't. So what does that mean? And um, just to sort of emphasize this point, another study where they actually, this is a very recent study, they used 24-hour impedance pH monitoring, which has now kind of become more of the gold standard for looking at LPR. And they took eight blinded uh, raters, um, same sort of setup, show them videos of patients' larynxes. And there was a poor to fair reliability of all the rating items. The average agreement here was actually a little higher, 48.7% to 78.7%. What's interesting was the, f the findings on the, uh, the scoring system for these patients versus the actual diagnosis of reflux based on impedance measurements did not correlate. The only significant correlation um, between the exam finding and having reflux was posterior commissure hypertrophy, but that was a negative correlation, meaning the more hypertrophy you had, the less likely you were to have reflux. Completely not what we have been taught, right? So that's, mis that's confusing. 24 to, sorry, 25 to 40 percent of those variants on multivariate analysis in the study were, were explained by effects of age, sex, and smoking. And this idea of pseudosulcus and thick mucus was correlated to male gender. So again, are these findings really specific for LPR, or are they even maybe variants of normal? So, okay, so this, the diagnosis of LPR based on symptoms and exam findings alone may not be that specific. But in Dr. Kaufman's paper, she showed that 85% of them got better on PPIs, irregardless, right? They got better, even if they didn't have reflux on, on pH testing. So why not just throw them some PPIs? Why not give it to them? They come, you don't know and what else you do with this patient with lobus, right? Give them PPI, have them come back, maybe they'll get better. Um, but the problem is that doesn't work. Um, there have been nine randomized controlled trials comparing PPI to placebo for treating LPR. Of those nine studies, only three show a significant difference between PPI and placebo effect. Of the ones that show a placebo effect, interestingly, most of them show that patients get better no matter what over time. Symptomatically, they improve after three to six months. 
So is that a placebo effect potentially or whatever they have going on maybe is self-limiting. The throat clearing they have, the globus they have, whatever that is, seem, maybe it's just self-limiting to six months and it goes away naturally. We don't know. And I wanted to look closer at these three studies to see what the significant difference was and why they found a significant difference while the others didn't. So the first, the earliest study that found a difference, they did a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. Okay, um, in their group, more than 50% of these patients had classic GERD symptoms of heartburn and regurgitation. They were given three months of lanzoprazole uh, through 30 milligrams BID versus placebo. It was a very small group, only 22 patients total. And seven out of the 22 had complete resolution of symptoms. Six were in the PPI group, and one was in the placebo group. So the conclusion was that patients got better with PPIs. Um, and interestingly, on, again, scope exam, there was no significant difference in resolution of the laryngeal signs. So not really a specific finding. But my question to this study is, because of the high number of patients with classic reflux, are we successfully treating patients for LPR with PPR, or are we really just treating classic GERD? Because they have, they have such a high population of patients here with classic GERD. So it's hard, it's, it's hard to tell. They didn't, the population here is, is maybe not the target population we're really going for with PPIs. So a second study, um, this is in 2008, a bigger study funded by AstraZeneca, you know, the makers of Nexium. Um, they, they diagnosed LPR solely based on RSI and RFS. Um, and then they gave them three months of omeprazole versus placebo. And they found a significant difference in total RSI score after treatment. So their conclusion is Nexium works for treating LPR. But if you look at actually the individual symptoms that improved, the only symptom on RSI that was significantly different for the PPI group at week 12 was heartburn, which we know PPI helps. So the, at the end of the day, we help them with heartburn with PPI, not, not their throat clearing, not their globus, not their hoarseness. Right? Another study here is showing a difference. Three months of um, as, um, as effects, I can't say, ribipazole uh, versus placebo. And they confirmed LPR based on a combination of RSI, RFS, pH monitoring, and EGD. And uh, more than 50% of the patients had LPR based on objective testing. And again, they found a significant difference in the total RSI score for the PPI group. So here's their data. This is um, RSI. This is the weeks of treatment. At week 12, they stopped treatment completely because there was a washout period. So in the placebo group, nothing really happened. Their, score, their symptoms stay the same. In the PPI group, they got better. So, right, they got better. And then when you, the, you stop the treatment, they got worse. So that makes that's great. So PPI is doing something. Two things, though. The difference is actually not that great. They go from a little over 14 in their symptoms to a little under 12. So there's a two-point difference in their symptoms overall with PPI therapy, with high-dose PPI therapy. So I don't know if that's a really clinically significant difference or not. And also on RFS, interestingly, all patients got better based on the clinicians who were blinded to the rating. So there seems to be maybe a placebo effect on the clinicians uh, of, the, uh, of the exam findings. And again, when they broke it down and looked at the specific symptoms and what got better over time that was significant, heartburn was the consistent symptom that got better at six weeks and at 12 weeks. There was also some improvement in globus, and that went away at 12 weeks. But excess throat mucus was better at 12 weeks, so unclear about that. But for sure, significant difference in heartburn symptoms okay, in the PPI group. So at the end of the day, when we give PPIs to patients, does it really help them? I don't know. And um, PPI also, you have to f remember, is not without side effects. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could just give it to them and have a placebo effect and have them feel better. But we have to be aware also when we give this out, one of the high economic costs of this, but two, also the side effects. Um, PPIs are irreversibly uh, inhibiting the hydrogen potassium ATPase of the parietal cells. So short-term effects of this include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, headache, angioedema, anaphylaxis. Um, those are pretty rare. Um, but, so those can be a problem. And then more importantly, there's some long-term effects of PPI therapy that we're, um, we've started to realize. Uh, interferes with calcium, vitamin B12, and iron ab uh, absorption. There's an increased risk of hip fracture in these patients. Um, and that's greatest when you have over a year-long course. And it's actually highest in patients with high-dose PPI use. That's greater than 1.75 doses a day, right, which is what we're giving them. Um, their odds ratio of getting a hip fracture is 2.65 uh, once they uh, are on PPIs for a year or more. 
There's also an increased risk of C. diff colitis, community-acquired and hospital-acquired pneumonia. And it induces atrophic gastritis. And the jury is still out on what this means. Um, the, the theory in the GI literature is that atrophic gastritis is on a spectrum of developing adenocarcinoma of the stomach. So you start with atrophic gastritis, and then you work, you know, and then cells look funnier, and they end up with adenocarcinoma. And patients with H. pylori, um, who are on PPIs, have a faster development to atrophic gastritis. So there are some there are some papers in the GI literature that suggest if you're going to put patients on prolonged PPI therapy, you need to test them for H. pylori and eradicate it um, because you're going to increase or speed up their development of atrophic gastritis. It's not a consensus in the GI literature, so I'm you know, not sure what, about that yet, if we should be doing it um, routinely, but something to consider. And also, in animal studies, it's shown that when you give them PPIs long-term, you can induce actually a, a gastrin-secreting tumor. So, not shown in patients yet. Now, another interesting thing is when you scope these people, these patients develop uh, very impressive polyposis of the, of the stomach lining. These polyps are almost too numerous to count. They really are. There's hundreds and hundreds of these polyps. And uh, when you ask the, the gastroenterologist, what's the about them possibly developing neoplasia, or how do you biopsy the, the jury is out? There's no possible way to actually biopsy all of these things. And so the issue about following these patients simply because you place them on pump on pump inhibitors, they become more and more relevant as this plays out. But you can do if you scope patients, if you're doing the sophodoscopy, pass that down on into the stomach and take a look. You'll tell who's on pump pump inhibitors. Um, so so the problem is, right, we have inability to diagnose this and inability to treat this, potentially. Well, the new theory is, you know why they're not responding to PPI therapy? It's because it's not acid that's the problem. That's sort of the new train of thought is that the problem is pepsin, is that these patients are refluxing, potentially non-acidic reflux, which is why it's not picked up with the you know, pH testing, and then depositing pepsin in our pharynx and larynx. And this pepsin is what's damaging the tissues. So pepsin is, you know, protease. It breaks down protein. It's really most active at pH 2. And at pH 6.5, it's completely inactivated. But it's stable um, around that. So it, it doesn't, um, you know, break down. It, it's, it's there, just inactive. And so the idea is you reflux up pepsin. And when then when you drink or eat acidic foods, you activate the pepsin. That's the kind of new... Uh, ideas coming out of, you know, Dr. Kaufman has a book on this and some recent papers on this. And so, actually, one of the suggestions, one of the recent papers is you should maybe drink alkaline water for LPR because then you're deactivating the pepsin, um, which is, again, very interesting thought, right, that maybe it's not, we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at the wrong marker completely. And if that's the case, maybe pepsin should be the marker for LPR, that we, we should really just be testing for pepsin in the saliva something like that, you know, to confirm LPR. And that's how we should diagnose these patients. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And the, this whole idea of non-acidic reflux, um, uh, since this idea came about, um, we, start, we developed a tool now called multi-channel and intraluminal <coughs> impedance and pH monitoring. So basically the prin principle of impedance measurements is that you measure a change in, resi in resistance of the, of the probe as a bolus passes. So a bolus has less resistance than air, right? Because there's, it's liquid for the most part. And so you, you get a drop in resistance. And so you can measure reflux, whether or not it's acidic. Um, and so that provides you with a lot more information. And the idea is that you can differentiate between a swallow, which is anterograde bolus movement, versus retrograde or reflux movement. And you can tell what kind of reflux you're getting. Is it gas, liquid, or solid? Um, so I actually here have a drawing of it. So you know the bolus passes through, you get uh, initially an increase in impedance because you get more air in the esophagus and then the impedance decreases because the bolus passes through and then it kind of goes back up again once the bolus is passed. And so you can get data about how much non-acid reflux the patient is having. There are still some controversies about this as well because this, the, the pH probe in these, uh, in these impedance probes um, in the pharynx tend to dry out and then can give you false positive readings. Also, this data does not seem to correlate with other ways to measure reflux, uh, such as the pharyngeal pH probes developed, you know, the ResTech probes, have you guys heard of that? It's supposed to be more comfortable. You just place it um, in the pharynx or the nose. 
And also there's Bravo pH testing, which is the little capsule you, you place in the distal esophagus. And the data is not lining up. And they're kind of all over the place. Some data shows Bravo testing shows more reflux events. Some show impedance shows more reflux events. So it's kind of unclear what is the best tool at this point. But it does provide us with more information, at least about non-acidic reflux. So then if that's the case, and they're refluxing non-acidic content, PPIs are not going to help, right? So the next jump would be, what if we gave, what if we did a fundoplication in these patients? Or what if we stopped reflux? Yeah. Sorry. Um, do those data, <clears throat> the, we know they don't line up with um, impedance testing. Do they line up with each other? No, they don't line up. Okay. They're all over the place. Yeah. The, the, the data is confusing. The, they don't all, they're not across the board the same at all. So the GI literature is also kind of conf confused about what is the best tool to use. Yeah. So it could be the best tool. We don't have a consensus anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a new tool. There's not that much published on it yet, especially for LPR. Most LPR studies just use the double pro pH. They don't, they don't use impedance testing. So yeah, there's still, the jury's still out. We don't know. Yeah. But it's, and it's a good idea. I think it's, it's a good way to, to look at things because it gives it answers, helps answer that question. Is it non-acidic reflux? But the problem is now, if you have a patient that comes in, didn't respond to PPI therapy, they're positive on impedance testing for non-acidic reflux, do you then jump to fundoplication for this patient, for their symptoms? I mean, so there's some papers looking at, there's not too many. Um, this is one by Dr. Kaufman, looking at patients treated with fundoplication for LPR. Um, so initially, their RSI symptoms were pretty high, 23.2 mean, and then at 14 months after surgery, it went down to 16.7, which is good, but it's still symptomatic, and even according to the scale, you know, the cutoff of 13, and the error bars are pretty big, so unclear how much effect we're really having. Also, interestingly, very interesting, I think, is that if you look at the group who did not improve with surgery, six out of seven of those didn't improve with PPI therapy. So is this really better than PPI therapy? And if they fail PPI therapy, are they going to do better with fund application? I don't think that question can be answered with this study. Um, this is another one. I think it's a better design study trying to answer this question. So they took 72 patients with suspected LPR and put them on four months of PPIs. 47 got better, so they fell out of the study. 24, 25 of them didn't respond at all to PPI therapy. 10 of them underwent fundoplication, and 15 continued with PPI therapy. All of them had pH-proven reflux, okay? So this graph shows, basically the point of this one is showing that the, the fundoplication worked. At baseline, they have acidic reflux. On PPI, their acidic reflux got better. After surgery, it continued to be in normal. So this is just proving that, indeed, the fundoplication was successful in these patients. But then you look at their symptom response to the fundoplication. Out of the 10 patients who got fundoplication, only one patient got better. 10%. So one patient got better with symptomatically, even though you successfully treated them for their, for their reflux. So again, are the symptoms caused by reflux? One patient got better in the PPI group who continued PPIs. So really no difference in PPI versus fundoplication when it comes to symptom relief. And so then, you know, the question is, well, are we affecting pepsin levels with fundoplication, right? Are we really decreasing levels of pepsin with fundoplication? And so here's a study asking that question. Um, they took patients before um, fundoplication, measured their pepsin levels, and then looked at their pepsin levels after. And their conclusion was, this works. Anti-reflux surgery improves symptoms and clears pepsin from the upper airway. Detection of pepsin improves diagnostic accuracy in patients with LPR. But if you look at their data closely, I don't think you can really make these conclusions. They have nine patients only, so it's a small group. And they compared, like apples to oranges, they compared pre-op biopsy proven pepsin of the, of the pharynx or a post-cricoid area to pepsin in the sputum. And we still, right now, don't know what that means, the pepsin in the sputum versus pepsin when on biopsy. So it's not, you're not comparing the same thing before and after surgery. Also, three of the patients actually failed surgery. So if you look at their Demeester scores before and after surgery, one of them actually got a lot worse, and two of them didn't have any improvement. But of the three failed surgeries, two of the patients had pepsin go from positive to negative, and one patient had good symptom improvement. And that was the one whose Demeester score went from like a 12 to 42. 
So what does that mean? And then one patient didn't have pepsin before or after the surgery, which failed anyways. So I don't think the conclusion, they, that you can really make that conclusion based on there. It's an interesting idea, and I think we need more people, really, in a bigger study. And also, sorry, one interesting, one patient had successful surgery and negative pepsin post-op, but their symptoms did not improve. And my question for the pepsin literature is, um, you know, what are we really measuring with pepsin? None of the studies really m mention the uh, ideas of the fact that there's isoforms of pepsin. So in the pulmonary literature, they're starting to bring this idea up of, like, of, of these reflux studies and asking, are we really measuring pepsin from the stomach? Or are we measuring something else? And there's actually something called pepsinogen C that's made in our stomach and our lungs. Uh, it's helped, it's uh, needed for the process of making surfactant in our lungs. It's the same as pepsinogen A. It's activated in an acidic environment, it's a protease, it does very similar things. Our stomach also makes it for the same purposes as it makes pepsin A, which is to digest protein. And um, a study here out of the, the pulmonary literature looked at 51 patients who underwent surgery for unrelated to reflux or the larynx. Um, and they collected spu the sputum after intubation. And 11 out of the 15, 51 patients had detectable total pepsin. There was actually no detectable pepsin A, the one that's made in your stomach, in these samples. All the pepsin was contributed to pepsin C. And none of the, the ENT literature looking at pepsin has actually differentiated between the two and has used pepsin C as a control group. So again, unclear if these studies are really looking at the right marker at this point. Um, and so I just want to finish this talk with, you know, the fact that there's a lot of unknowns. I think it's a really big topic. It's um, a lot of data out there. Um, I only sort of touched the surface of all of this. Um, but I think that before we all could jump to the con consensus and come out with a position statement as a profession on LPR, we need to understand this better. And I think some things I learned from doing this, uh, putting this together, this Grand Rounds, is that if patients present with hoarseness, you should not assume the diagnosis is LPR. It's something else. And they warrant a stroboscopy if you can't see what it is on flexible laryngoscopy. And if you still are not sure, then refer them to a laryngologist if you can, if you have that resource. Um, because time and time again, these papers have shown that the hoarseness is not from LPR. And I personally don't even know what LPR hoarseness is supposed to sound like. I mean, you know spasmodic dysphonia sounds like a strained voice with breaks. Um, you know. Uh, vocal full paralysis is a breathy voice. What is the vo what is the sound of LPR? I don't I don't know what the, I don't know what it is, personally. Um, cash register. It's a cash <laughs> register. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, and so you know, consider alternative explanations for patient symptoms before you jump to LPR. Um, and you know, the flexible laryngoscopy exams uh, of this vague ear edema and edema is not reliable. That's not helpful. Looking at their throat and seeing nothing <laughs> but maybe some erythema edema it's, means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. So you can't really rely on that. Um, if you're going to try PPI, then I suggest, this is just my own recommendation. I, I'm, I'm just basing this off of the randomized controlled trials because they only use three month course. But do a three month course instead of the six months because there are side effects to PPIs. And when they don't, when they don't respond after three months, do some more objective testing. Move on to impedance, pH testing, confirm whether or not they even have reflux. And if they don't, think of something else that could be causing their problem. And if they don't have classic symptoms of heartburn regurgitation, maybe reconsider PPI therapy altogether. And at the end of the day, I think you know, a lot more research needs to be done. I think we need to stop writing review articles about this, and we need to actually come up with real data to, to review for the review article. <laughs> so, all right. That's kind of my, thank you very much for listening. Are you writing a review article? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to summarize this up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, this this is a tendency in our literature to parrot over and over. I mean, it gives me heartburn for yeah. oh, um, yeah. Over and over. Oh, I played that for the whole hour. <laughs> over and over, you yeah. know, you see early positions taken. Repeated over and over until they become accepted dogma. Right. And then it takes someone like you to come and be smart about it and raise questions and, and to see it in a different perspective. So, yeah. so I applaud this. This is the kind of critical thinking we need. Thank you. And, and it is interesting how fashions come and go in medicine. 
to some degree this may be a passion. What do you think about LPR and laryngeal cancer? Yeah, so that's a whole other topic, and I try to delve into that for this presentation. I realize I should leave it alone because that's a whole other thing. But I don't think that, that you could, it's been proven at all. It's a correlation, definitely. There's a relationship with increased uh, rates of reflux in people with cancer. Um, but the question is, the things that cause laryngeal cancer, such as smoking and drinking, cause reflux. So you can't, and then when people, and there are a few studies that actually do multivariate analysis, like good statistics, and they look at this, they don't find that it, there's a relationship. So the problem is a lot of our literature is small case series with poor stats. And then we find this correlation, but we don't, we really can't come up, you know, with a firm conclusion. So I don't think where, you can, yeah. Where it comes up is in legal cases where old laryngologists attend the tobacco industry. It says yes. that the cancer is from LPR rather than the fact that the person is 68 back years old. Yeah, definitely. I've seen that repeatedly. Definitely. And we, we tap this. I mean, it's in our position statement. It says that um, LPR causes cancer. It says it in our, in our position. So they can cite that as evidence, right? Evidence. Yeah. Oh, it's not only that. Wait, I don't know how to do Yeah. So based upon, you know, all this review that you've done, you know, who, someone comes into your clinic, is there anyone that you would prescribe a PPI for for LPR after doing all this research? That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I think if their history is convincing enough, like today, we saw a patient who came in who has a vocal full granuloma, muscle tension dysphonia as well, so other issues for his hoarseness. But he specifically states that after I eat a meal, immediately I get this globus sensation, a lot of mucus in my throat. It's, it happens a couple, sometimes a couple hours, but it's after I eat always. And I tend to eat very late at night with a big meal and then it's very fatty. And that's when it happens, when I eat a fatty meal. I mean, well then yeah, I think your globus and mucus may be related to reflux and I treat them. I think it has to do with the individual case and the patient and what they're telling you. If their main complaint is I'm hoarse, I'm hoarse, I'm hoarse, I'm hoarse, it's probably not LPR. But if they're saying, you know, you know, I, I have globus, I have thick mucus, I sometimes get heartburn, I eat a lot of spicy food, I mean maybe, then that patient I would try on, on, on PPIs. What's the prevalence of LPR in bulimics? In bulimics? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> that's a great study. But the definition is 100%. That's a great study. <laughs> <laughs> and do they have pepsin? That's a great, that would be a great study. Yeah, I would think an interesting thing in the history, too, would be to ask which comes first, LPR. Yeah. There were studies I read a few years ago where they found uh, cheap cells in the larynx. Is that true? Uh, I don't know about cheap cells, but there is such a phenomenon where you get metaplasia uh, in the pharynx, where the, the cells are, are of uh, stomach origin, I believe. Okay. Um, but they don't, they're, the, they're eyelids of it, and I don't think they are clinically, they don't do anything. I don't think they secrete anything. Not that I know of. I think it's just an incidental finding. But some people think that that may be the cause of people's globus sensation as one of the explanations. So. I, would, I would just say, as, as we're all scholars here, um, resist the tendency to fluff your CV with review papers unless they have a unique and new voice, right? Yes. And, and, but these Me Too ones over and over, really, when, when someone's going to look at your CV and see it, if they know the field, they're not going to be impressed by that. It's not real science. You can say it's education. There's certainly a role for review papers. They get cited very often, and often parroting on opinions with greater and greater weight over time. Uh, but just be selective about it, just like case reports. Just because you have an interesting case doesn't mean it's worth writing up, unless it has some new insight into pathogenesis, diagnosis, or treatment. Right? Then it's worth doing. But very few case reports are worth writing up. Tiny fraction of ones that they are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well. Oh, thank you.